church. Um, I'm not a preacher, <laughs> but I have shared with congregations before, so just um, pray for me, and I will be sharing from the heart. Um, as most of you know, I had a series of health meetings in my home in June, and I invited the people who attended uh, to ask questions, and Stephen asked about health in the Bible. We didn't have time to get to that per se, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. And as Adventists, we have a health message. Um, you know what the Bible says about clean and unclean meats and so on and so forth, but there's a lot more to health in the Bible than just that. And it's almost 12 o'clock, so I hope we have time to do this. Um, Abunda wonderful life. I did not come up with that phrase, but I, I kept thinking, what should I call this message? And I had two or three different titles during the week, and I forgot one of them and lost my notes <laughs> and started over. And then I had to merge, so it took more time than it should have. But uh, OK, I need something that people can remember, maybe. And this was um, from a play my boys were in when they were in church school. It was about the Good Shepherd, a, a musical play for children. And I can remember, you know, they were all supposed to dress up like sheep. One of them was the shepherd, and the rest of them were sheep. So they had to wear white clothes with black socks on their hands and feet, you know. And, uh, and in the school, there was an Asian family. I can't remember now if they were from China or Korea. But anyway, they had three little girls in the school, and they were the cutest little sheep, they had on the prettiest frilly lacy dresses like little brides, you know, <laughs> and then their little black socks. And Iris was the one who's, you know, they were talking about their shepherd, what a good shepherd he was, and she said, yes, he's a wonderful shepherd, and a bundle wonderful shepherd, <laughs> you know, I just see her saying that. So he is our abunda wonderful shepherd. He, promises us an abundant life, or abundant, wonderful life. So, as you also know, we recently had Dr. Miller here, and I'm not going to reiterate what he said. I hope you listen to him, either here or online. But he did say something interesting. We're all familiar with the eight health laws, right? New start. Um, but he said there are actually 15. And so I kind of organized this talk around that. And hopefully we'll get through it. But our Sabbath school class was actually a good lead in. Um, Exodus 15 verse 26 says, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will listen to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals you. God is our healer. He tells us things to help us be in health, but he's the one who heals us. If we listen to his health counsel, he can bless us. Um, he made us, he knows what is good for us, right? Deuteronomy 7.15 And the Lord will take away from thee 
all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee. And I really like the whole chapter of Psalm 103, but I'm just going to read 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. He wants to heal all our diseases, but we need to be willing to listen to what he said to us. And in the New Testament, of course, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. My favorite health verse is 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. We can claim that promise, but our soul can't prosper unless we're in communion with the Lord and walking with him and willing to obey him, right? If we have good good spiritual health, we can be blessed with good physical health. Um, Psalm 42.11 and also Psalm 43.5 says the same thing, except one word is left out. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. We don't talk about our countenance, except, you know, generally think your countenance is your face, your appearance. So I looked it up. Um... He's our salvation, our savior, the God of our being. So countenance and that thing means means our whole person. He's the health of our total person, spiritual, mental, physical. So I think I was supposed to, what do I push here? Wrong direction. Nope. Okay. Okay. Can you see that? Um, I tried to find the top 10 or whatever number they had for this year, and they pretty much said it hasn't changed much in the last two years. So the top cause of death is heart disease, second is stroke, third pulmonary, fourth lower respiratory, fifth Alzheimer's and other dementias, Sixth, trachea, bronchus, and lung cancers. Seventh, diabetes. Eighth, road injury. Nine, diarrheal diseases. And ten, tuberculosis. We have plenty of diseases in the world. There were some lists of top 20, and, um, and that doesn't cover all the diseases, of course. But, as you said... You know what this stands for, right? Tell me. N? Nutrition. Nutrition. E? W? W? Sunshine. Sunshine. T? Temperance. Okay. Trust in God. That's the foundation. Okay, we're all familiar with those. How can we get 15? We're used to these eight. These are the 15 that Dr. Miller presented. Sunshine, the eight are in there. Trust, exercise, water. He's got two for A. Air and attitude. Then two for R, rest and regularity, diet and dress, self-control, which is a new word for temperance, herbs and hygiene, innocence, and purity of life. Personally, I don't see much difference between the last two, but anyway. Um, 
So, first one is sunshine, and you can't see all of those. But God created a sun for us, right? Um, and he said it was good. He knew we needed it. Sometimes these health principles are not spelled out in the Bible, but God gave us what we need to live and be healthy. Um, Ecclesiastes 11.7, Truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. And I don't think that means it's just that it's joyful for us. Not too long ago I heard that if you look at the sun, I mean, you don't want to stare at a really bright sun directly, but there's a certain time of day that you can look at the sun and it will actually be healing to certain eye problems like farsightedness or whatever. It is a good thing to have the sun and to behold it. Malachi 4.2 tells us, But unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Why is Jesus compared to the sun in the sky if the sun isn't healing? Because Jesus is healing, right? He is the one who heals us, but he gives us the things we need to be healthy. And these are um, some of the things that come. We can't see the top one, but if you get a just a few minutes of sunlight on your hands and face every day, you get all the vitamin D you need. Sunlight strengthens the immune system. It relieves arthritic pain. It lowers blood cholesterol, relieves PMS. Of course, you have to be careful. Excessive burning can lead to skin cancer. But I've read recently that you do need some sun you just guard against being burned. Um, so don't be so scared of skin cancer that you don't get out there because tanning is protective against damage. And the darker your skin, the more you need. So that brings us to trust. I've already said it, but trust in God is foundational to good health. If we trust God, it means we're willing to obey him, right? We believe he means what he says, that he says it for a good reason. Um, and there are several beautiful scriptures about trusting the Lord. One that I, I learned a musical setting of back when I was a teenager, so I memorized it back then. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. If you have health, you have strength, right? And if you have peace, you're more likely to have health. People who are not at peace are more prone, more disease prone and accident prone. Psalm 42, 11 and 43, 5, I already read to you. Don't be downcast. Don't be discouraged or depressed because we have a wonderful God who takes care of us and provides for our needs. He's the health of our being, so we look to him. Psalm 67, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that thy way may be known upon thy earth, this, thy saving health among all nations. How many of you were in Sabbath school and saw the mission clip? Yeah, and those of us who took the light training or are still doing it, health is a wonderful way to minister to people and open up the door to be able to witness to them. So, um, as we trust in the Lord, he blesses us, and then we can bless others and bring them to him.
Proverbs 3. This is kind of a long passage, and you're familiar with verses 5 and 6. Trust, say it with me. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. But look what the next verse says or the next two, be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and morrow to thy bones. That's a health scripture. We need good morrow in our bones, right? Um, I don't know what all it does, but I know it's important. And some people who are very sick have to receive bone morrow transplants. But trusting in the Lord and Obeying him instead of following our own ways will give us health. And I'm not sure why it says health to thy navel, but um, the navel is where we receive nourishment before we are born, so it's very important in that respect. Um, Last week I sang these verses to you, but they are health verses too. Did you notice that? Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him? I left out, of, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. So part of our health is tied up in ministering to the needs of others. Did you realize that? We are called to take God's healing, grace, and mercy to the world. And as we do that, he blesses our health. Proverbs 4. My son, attend to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Let my sayings not depart from your eyes. Keep them in your heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Obeying God is health. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Let your eyes look right on, and your eyelids look straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, and let all your ways be established. Turn not to the right hand or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. So don't get drawn in by worldly fads. Follow the Lord's counsel and that will bring health. Proverbs 12, 18, There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. So this is kind of, uh, if we're following God's counsel and his wisdom, then we will be speaking words of the wise, right? When we're not listening, we may be piercing like a sword, and that's not helpful to anyone. It affects not only us, but those around us. Um, Jeremiah, in chapter 8, 14, says, Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves and let us enter into the defense cities, and let us be silent there. For the Lord our God hath put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. We looked for peace, but no good came, and for a time of health, and behold, trouble. 
So back to this blessings and cursings that we read about in Sabbath school. When we obey the Lord, we have health. When we disobey, we have trouble. And it's contrasted with health, so part of that trouble is the lack of health. Jeremiah 8, 19. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country. Isn't the Lord in Zion? Isn't her king within the country? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Why? The first part of the verse answered it, because we haven't followed his counsel. We haven't trusted the Lord. He wants to heal us. And that brings me back to Psalm 103 that said, He heals all our diseases. He forgives all our iniquities. It says he renews our, our youth. Um, and he doesn't deal with us after our sins, nor reward us according to our iniquities. When bad things happen, yes, it's because of sin in the world, but like Jesus told people in his day, this man wasn't born blind because of his sin or his parents' sin. It's just the devil is in control here. God isn't vengeful. <clears throat> he doesn't <clears throat> strike us because we're disobeying. <clears throat> But when we disobey, we bring bad on ourselves because we're not following the laws he's established, you know. We need sunshine. We need exercise. We need all these things to be in health. And when we refuse to do them, we get into trouble. John 13, 17, therefore says, If ye know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Um, in our prayer warriors, we read this. One of the more remarkable findings in recent years is the relationship of prayer, faith, and church attendance on the immune system. Next paragraph. Findings suggest that persons who attend church frequently have stronger immune systems than less frequent attenders. They have trust in God. And... I would propose that the stronger your trust and faith, the more you're going to obey him and the healthier you will be. Mortality for persons attending religious services one or more times a week was almost 25% lower than for persons who attend less frequency. With women, it was 35% lower. So developing a relationship with the Lord is life-saving in more ways than one. From Ministry of Healing we read, Gratitude and trust open the heart to the healing power of God. The energies of the whole being are vitalized and the life forces triumph. I know uh, I didn't look any of them up, but there are lots of studies nowadays. Doctors are finding that people who have a faith and a good attitude have a much better chance against disease. And there it was told to us over a hundred years ago. Um, the love which Christ diffuses through the whole being is a vitalizing power. Every vital part, the brain, the heart, the nerves, it touches with healing. So we can trust him. That's not supposed to come in right there. <laughs> okay. Oh, where I am on here now. Okay. Now we're on exercise. Okay, the Bible doesn't tell us to do 10 jumping jacks and walk a mile every day. In fact, there's one scripture in the New Testament that says bodily exercise profits little. <laughs> but I don't think 
it uh, means that we shouldn't do it. It just means that it's more important to focus on our relationship with God. And I remember hearing evangelists say, you know, some people who don't believe in the Sabbath say, but it's not mentioned, you know, it's not listed in the New Testament, like thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, are all listed. And it doesn't say, remember the Sabbath day. And the answer was, the Sabbath was not a problem in those days. Thank you. In fact, Jesus had to show them how to keep the Sabbath because they were so rigid with the Sabbath that it had become a burden. So he didn't need to say, remember the Sabbath day. They remembered it. They just didn't remember it in the right way. And I don't think he needed to tell them, you have to walk 30 minutes every day because they were walking nearly everywhere they went. You know, it's a day's journey over to this village or <laughs> half a day's journey to that village. They got plenty of exercise. Thank you for the water. Um, but Proverbs says, a wise man is strong. A man of knowledge increases strength. We do things to keep ourselves strong if we are wise. Proverbs 31, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroys kings. So don't spend your energy on things that aren't worth it. You save your strength, build your strength, don't dissipate it. Proverbs 31, 17, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. There's some kind of exercise going on. In 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. And there are many benefits of exercise. It strengthens the heart, it lowers blood pressure and the resting heart rate, protecting the heart and blood vessels, lowers the LDL cholesterol levels and often raises the good cholesterol, strengthens the bones, lifts depression, relieves anxiety and stress, increases energy and efficiency, helps maintain desirable weight, improves circulation so that we have clearer minds, better sleep, faster healing of damaged body areas. And we were told back in 1868, morning exercise in walking in the free invigorating air of heaven or cultivating a garden is necessary to a healthful circulation of the blood. It is the surest safeguard against colds, coughs, congestion of the brain and lungs, inflammation of the liver, kidneys, lungs, and a hundred other diseases. Water. Okay, he doesn't tell us a specified amount of water to drink either, but he did say, you shall serve the Lord your God and he shall bless thy bread and thy water. So he promises water to us. He knows we need it. Um, Isaiah 33, he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, uh, etc. He will dwell on high, his place of defense will be in the munitions of the rocks, bread will be given him and his water will be sure. That's talking about the time of trouble, he will provide our needs and water is one of them. In John, Jesus told us, whosoever drinks of the water I give him will never thirst, but it will be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He talked about water because water is a necessary element, and he is necessary. He is the true water of life. We will have the water of life in heaven, and we are invited to be there. As you know, our bodies are about 70% water. Our kidneys can process so much per hour, so we need to drink enough that they can handle, keep our urine pale. We lose 10 to 12 a day. 
through the various organs and functions. Food provides two to four cups, but we need to drink eight to ten. Or you can follow one of those formulas. One ounce for each kilogram of body weight, half an ounce for each pound of body weight. You should have enough water unless you're working out really hard or out in the sunshine or something that's using up more water. Signs of dehydration, dry, sticky mouth, sleepiness, tiredness, thirst. Uh, with a baby, you can see if they're not having enough wet diapers. Constipation, dry skin, headache, fewer no tears dizziness or lightheadedness. And we were told, pure water to drink and fresh air to breathe, invigorate the vital organs, purify the blood, and help nature in her task of overcoming the bad conditions of the system. We didn't need modern health advisors to tell us. Um, well, that mentions fresh air also, which is our next point. We were created by God breathing air into us. And he is the one who gives us our air, as Job 12. In his hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. All the while the breath of God is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. He knows we need air. He gives us our first breath. He reserves it for us if we die till he resurrects us. That we need to breathe deeply. It can improve our energy level, slow our heart rate, clean out our lungs, reduce anxiety. As a voice teacher, I have to teach my students how to breathe deeply. Do you all know how to breathe deeply? <laughs> you, um, the easiest way to learn is when you go home, lie flat on your bed and notice how you breathe. Usually when you tell someone to take a deep breath, they go... <sighs> you don't need to get your breath here and raise your shoulders. Your breath needs to come to your diaphragm. And I, I was looking online for things about this, and it said, look at the way you breathe when you breathe deeply. Are you going out here or here? It should be down here. Well, some people tell me it's really hard to do that if they're not used to it. So lie flat on your back because you cannot raise your shoulders or your chest when you're on your back. You will see your abdomen go up and down. And get used to how it feels and breathe that way when you stand up. That's how you breathe deeply. Now I lost my place. Okay. Um, our attitude is the other A. This first scripture is one of my favorites. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth and with my song will I praise him. Is the Lord your strength and your shield? Then can you praise him? No matter what's happening in your life or all around you, you can keep praising him. He's going to be your strength and your shield. 104.33, I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. I saw a video someone posted on Facebook yesterday, and I would like to have included it in here, but I couldn't figure out how to download it. Um, but there's a retired surgeon in Loma Linda who's 104 years old. Did any of you see that? Well, he's on, he's on a plant-based diet, and he was advocating that. But um, he's still praising the Lord and, and still assisting with surgeries. He's, or he was till last year or sometime recently. But he's still, you know, walking every day for exercise. He's doing great because um, he's following the Lord's health laws and he's praising the Lord at 104. 
Proverbs 11:25 The liberal soul shall be made fat he that watereth shall be watered also himself that has to do with our attitude you know uh, you don't find the word attitude in the bible and in scriptures that are just laid out for you a bad attitude does this a good attitude. but it talks about different attitudes we can have and when i read this i thought of scrooge his attitude was not liberal at all, was it? He was stingy. That's a type of attitude. But if our attitude is liberal, we will be watered. Our soul will be made fat. Um, and that talks about our whole being. Your soul is your whole person. You will be in good health. The fear of Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endures forever. And James 1, 5, and 6, If you lack wisdom, ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given you. And I put those in there because... Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. This is another one like we talked about earlier. What we say can damage someone else's health if our words are not kind and loving and generous and wise. But if we lack wisdom, we can go to God and he will give it to us. Obeying and fearing the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, Proverbs thirteen seventeen: A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. So if our attitude is devious or wicked in any way, it's going to cause trouble. But if we are faithful ambassadors for God, we will bring health to others. Pleasant words are as in honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Our words can bring health to others. A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Yes, things happen to make us sad, but we need to maintain a relationship with the Lord that enables us to keep joy in our hearts. We don't want to dry our bones because they're pretty important for our health. Brittle bones are no good. Dried up bones won't produce very good marrow, probably. And, um, and that's how we get our blood cells and stuff, right? The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. So, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He didn't try to exalt self. He humbled himself and became a servant to others, to us. He laid down his life for us. And if we're willing to follow his footsteps, follow his lead, he will bless us. Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That's an attitude we can have. Let your moderation or gentleness, some translations say, be known unto all men. Don't worry about things. Don't have an anxious attitude, but present everything to God and let him lead and he will keep you at peace. Focus on the positive things, verse 8 tells us. In 1 Thessalonians 5, I like a lot of these verses. I don't think we have time for all of them. But the last part, starting at verse 16, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. That's the attitude we're supposed to have, an attitude of gratitude. And it will bring health to us. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. Our whole spirit, soul, and body, that's our health. If we're obeying him, if we're following his counsel, to give thanks always. And, oh, that went fast. These are just some 
various people that say the same thing. The unthankful heart discovers no mercies, but let the thankful heart sweep through the day, as, and as the magnet finds the iron, so it will find in every hour some heavenly blessings. Gratitude turns what we have into enough. A grateful heart is a magnet for miracles. Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. So look for the good and thank the Lord, thank those who bless you. It is not happy people who are thankful, it is thankful people who are happy. Train yourself to find the blessing in everything. Uh, when our oldest son was about four months old, I think, we were living in Wisconsin and General Conference was in Dallas. My sister lives in a suburb of Dallas, so I wanted to go. Uh, Marvin was an intern pastor at the time. The senior pastor was a, a good friend, like a big brother to me. So I rode down with him and his mother and on the way, we had some kind of car trouble. I don't remember what. And she said, okay, let's see. What is the spiritual blessing in this? You know, she was a pastor's wife also. And she said she was used to making sermon illustrations out of everything that happened. But we need to do that. We need to look for the blessing in everything. And this is... Lower left one is from Tecumseh, the leader of the Shawnee back in the 17 and 1800s. When you rise in the morning, give thanks for the light for your life, for your strength. Give thanks for your food and for the joy of living. If you see no reason to give thanks, the fault lies in yourself. There's always something to be thankful for. The seven wonders of the world are to see, to hear, to touch, to taste, to feel, to laugh, and to love. When you, why does he do that? when you are grateful, when you can see what you have, you unlock blessings to flow in your life. When life is sweet, say thank you and celebrate. When life is bitter, say thank you and grow. So there's always something to make it good. Okay. Um, on the internet, I found these relating to the same thing. Do you look forward to next week? Do you feel younger than your age? Do you have a sense of purpose? If so, you may have already done something to reduce your risk of degenerative diseases and may even be adding years to your life. That's what we've been talking about. Your attitude affects your health. Your outlook, having a sense of optimism and purpose, seems to be predictive of health outcomes. And this is from Behavioral Sciences at Harvard School of Public Health. Emotional vitality characterized by enthusiasm, hopefulness, engagement in life, and the ability to face life's stresses with emotional balance is associated with a substantially reduced risk of heart attack and stroke. Other studies indicate that people who retain emotional vitality during chronic illness and disability also do better. They're able to live on their own and keep getting around and so forth. So it doesn't guarantee you will have no problems, but it does guarantee that you'll do much better than those who are not um, with a good attitude. The mind of Jesus Christ must be in us, controlling every thought, every purpose of our lives. This is the attitude in which we should ever keep our souls before God. This we will do if we realize the worth of souls and if the truth as it is in Jesus is stamped upon the soul. That's the attitude we have, the mind of Christ, like we read in Philippians 2. Courage, hope, faith, sympathy, love, promote health, and prolong life. 
a contented mind, a cheerful spirit is health to the body and strength to the soul. A merry heart does good like a medicine. In the treatment of the sick, the effect of mental influence should not be overlooked. Rightly used, this influence affords one of the most effective agencies for combating disease. We've heard that illness is 90% mental, right? That's what we're seeing over and over. Um, Rest. The Bible doesn't tell us to sleep eight hours a night, but it does tell us we need rest. God gave us the night for rest. And, you know, when in the times the Bible was written, they didn't have electric lights. They had to rest when it was night. Now people stay up, and they borrow from their health when they do so. But rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalm 4.8, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. 127.2 is interesting. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. We shouldn't be staying up late. It's not good for us. And... Jesus would come to his disciples and say, sleep on, take your rest, because it was time. There is a time for rest. And talking about a Lazarus, they said, if he's sleeping, he will do well. So they knew rest was beneficial to the health of a sick person. Rest is important. Benefits of rest. It allows your body to renew itself, waste products are removed, repairs are effected, enzymes are replenished, energy is restored, it aids in healing injuries, infections, other assaults on the body, including stress and emotional trauma. It strengthens the immune system. It adds length to your life. Now, this is interesting. In a large population study of health habits, Just a few years ago, it was found that people who regularly sleep seven to eight hours each night live longer than those who average less than seven or more than eight. Sometimes when people stay in bed more than eight, it's because they are depressed. Depression is not good for anyone's health. Um, If you lose only one hour of sleep each night. At the end of the week, you've lost seven hours, so practically a whole other night. So try to be faithful in getting the right amount every night. If you don't get enough sleep, you have less endurance, uh, more depression and bad moods, Increased irritability, more accident-prone, weaker immune system, decreased mental efficiency, hard time concentrating, and short-term memory loss. Uh, Go back. Okay. This, where was this? I don't remember where it was. But somewhere, talking about health online, it says... You love to say you're a night owl, but your body is telling a different story. Your circadian rhythms, the routine changes in your behavioral, mental, and physical functions that occur over the course of the day are regulated by a tiny area of the brain known as your biological clock. And it describes what it looks like, and it has 20,000 neurons. And it says... um, When you impose an artificial tempo to your day by going to bed late, there will be real health consequences. So this is not just something that we were told as a church, but the whole world is being told. Regularity is important. Okay. 
seven consequences of going to bed after midnight is that you don't get the right kind of sleep, the REM versus non-REM. You miss out on that if you go to bed too late. And you're prone to have more insomnia, more accidents, lowered immune response, greater cardiovascular risks, greater risk for cancer and obesity, interestingly enough. And there's a whole lot said about that. I did tell you where I found it if you want to look it up. Okay. Nature will restore their vigor and strength in their sleeping hours if her laws are not violated. We need rest. In regulating the hours for sleep, there should be no haphazard work. We should seek to rest at a seasonable hour and rise in the morning refreshed for the day's duties. Oh dear, what did I do now? <laughs> know how to get it back. Okay. So that mentioned regularity. Rest and regularity go hand in hand. Jesus gave us examples of regularity in his prayer life, and I'm sure when they said it's time for supper, it was a regular set time. We are supposed to have set times for doing these things, for rising, for eating, because of these circadian rhythms that I read about um, from the web page there. Your circadian rhythms, oh, I read you that. Am I going the wrong direction? Okay. Regularity in eating is of vital importance. There should be a specified time for each meal and then we eat what we need and eat nothing else till the next meal. Our stomachs need rest, our whole body, you know, needs to function together. And if we're keeping our stomach in turmoil, it throws everything else off. Then we have diet. God gave us a lot of things on diet in the Bible. You know, the original diet, he said, I've given you every herb bearing seed, Every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. And that's what he gave the animals to. There were no carnivores when God created the earth. Of course, at the time of the flood, he said man could eat meat. But there was a reason, right? Because all the plants were destroyed. I don't think he gave it to them as a permanent thing. It was temporary till the plants grew back. But they liked it, and they kept on. And he told them, and you can't see it, but in Genesis 9, 5, it says, And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast. So he told them eating meat would shorten their lives. And this is... What happened? Adam lived to be 930 years old. We got down to Jesus' time. It was much shorter, and it has remained much shorter. And we have the effects of all those years, so I don't think we're going to get back to 900 by switching to a plant-based diet, but we can increase our lifespan. Um, we have the example of Daniel and his friends. They refused the king's meat and wine. And I don't know whether Daniel was plant-based before he got to Babylon or not, but it sounds like he was when he got there. He may have eaten clean meat before, but I'm sure... Uh, the king's chef didn't drain the blood and cut off the fat and everything, which would have been okay for Daniel. So he said, just give us vegetables, plants to eat. And they ended up ten times fairer and wiser than the other people on the king's diet. Um, 
Ecclesiastes 10:17 says, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. That's what Daniel and his friends did. They wanted to eat for strength. They didn't want to eat the rich foods of the king, which would make them literally drunk if they drank his wine. But even food can do that to you. We had a friend in seminary who said, you know, his, his landlady would cook so much on Sabbath that he would feel drunk after eating. <laughs> if you eat too much, too much food, too much combination, it really makes you sluggish and drunk-like. Um, so we need to eat for strength, not for drunkenness. Not just the princes and kings, but Revelation says... God has made all of us kings and priests unto him. We are his royalty in the earth. We need to eat for strength. Oh, I guess I missed. Well, we know when we get to heaven, we're going to plant gardens and eat what we plant ourselves, right? We're not going to be going out butchering cows, so why not get in the habit now, right? It'll be healthier for us now and the customers to what we're going to have there. Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. These foods, prepared in as simple and natural a manner as possible, are the most healthful and nourishing. They impart strength, power of endurance, vigor of intellect. So why not eat them? God gave our first parents the food he designed the race should eat. It was contrary to his plan to have the life of any creature taken. There should have been no death in Eden. The fruit of the trees in the garden was the food man's once required. Next is dress. The Bible talks about um, dressing with modesty. 1 Timothy 2, 9, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, not with gold and pearls and costly array. Ezekiel fourteen seventeen says the priest um, in the inner court should wear linen, not wool, and um, it says an interesting thing at the end. They will not put on them anything that causes sweat. <laughs> I didn't do an in-depth study of that. But we should dress appropriately for the climate, right? While being modest. But we don't put too much clothing on or too little. And Deuteronomy tells us women don't wear men's clothing and vice versa. And, of course, in Revelation we have the contrast between the woman who represents God's people is dressed in um, fine, clean, white linen, very simple, modest. And the woman who represents Babylon is in costly, very... Um, showy dress and adornment, so we don't want to go that direction. Interestingly enough, I looked online and I did not quote it. If you want to look it up, that's a very interesting article, a lady writing about today's fashions, and it almost sounded like I was reading out of the testimonies, but don't wear tight clothing, and you know how much clothing is tight nowadays, but she talked about how it really um, affects our health, squeezing our organs and getting, but the reason I didn't quote it, she goes on to talk about some fashions which were not heard of over a hundred years ago, and the dangers of them, the very immodest, and so forth they definitely affect physical health. Next is self-control. 
Of course, we all know the fruits of the Spirit include self-control, or it's called temperance in King James. And the Bible tells us um, that we need to be temperate in all things. Proverbs 30 says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. I looked that up. That's, we don't use the word that way. It meant give me just enough to satisfy my needs, the, the right portion for me, so we're not going to overeat. That's not temperate, right? And in Peter, that's... The whole passage is nice, but he says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things pertaining unto life and godliness, and we're supposed to add to our growth, um, you know, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, or self-control, which bears on our health. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is just one little specific on health. Proverbs 10, 26. As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. How does a boss feel when he sends an employee to do something and they act like a sluggard? So is vinegar good for our teeth? We know smoke is not good for our eyes, it burns. I did a science fair experiment in junior high soaking a raw egg in vinegar overnight and it was just soft and squishy the next morning. Vinegar leaches calcium out of our bones and teeth. Um, it's not good for us. It's highly fermented, and it's highly acidic, which promotes or makes it easier for cancer germs to grow. Um, and Jesus on the cross refused the vinegar that they offered him when he was thirsty because he didn't want anything that would benumb his senses, it says. It was to deaden the pain, and he didn't want anything that would numb him in any way. We shouldn't either. A simple definition of temperance is moderation. Good things are used intelligently, and harmful things are not used at all. The goal of temperate living is peak physical, mental, and emotional well-being. It does not just involve alcohol, tobacco, tobacco and drug use, it refers to all aspects of our lifestyles, whether it be overeating, overworking, too much pay, too little, too much or little of anything. Such unbalanced living robs men and women of a rich, healthy, and satisfying life. And this is just from somewhere on the internet, something we already know, right? True temperance teaches us to dispense entirely with everything hurtful and use judiciously that which is helpful. We abstain from anything that blunts the conscience or encourages temptation. And then the H in stewardship is herbs. Herbs are mentioned a few times in the Bible, not always in the context of healing. I found this list online and it gave references for where they were found, which you can't see, unfortunately. But um, even though the Bible didn't always talk about how they were used medicinally, because of records from various cultures, we know herbs have been used medicinally since Bible times, and they can still be used. They are. It is no denial of faith to use rational remedies judiciously. Water, air, and sunshine are God's healing agents. The use of certain herbs that the Lord has made to grow for the good of man is in harmony with the exercise of faith. And the other H is hygiene. And the, 
the Bible has a lot of references to washing and cleansing. Some of it was ceremonial, but it was important. It was to demonstrate that we are supposed to be clean and neat and orderly. That um, is very vital to health. And that webpage that talked about modern fashions being unhealthful, talked about how some of the tight-fitting things uh, create more bacteria growth, um, make hygiene impossible. The human body can provide places for disease-causing germs and parasites to grow and multiply. These places include the skin, in and around openings to the body, and it is less likely that germs and parasites get inside the body if we have good hygiene habits. Scrupulous cleanliness is essential to both physical and mental health, etc. And neglect of cleanliness will induce disease. Sickness does not come without a cause. Then, the last two, innocence and purity of life, you tell me if you can see a difference. I don't see a lot of difference. If you're innocent, you're obeying God, so you're pure, right? If you have a pure life, you have a clear conscience. So anyway, Psalm 1913, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Proverbs 28, 20, A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. So if your eye is on wealth instead of God's ways, you're probably going to lose your innocence. Hebrews 10, 22, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Who shall, stand, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, etc. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness. And with that comes healing. We've already read in other scriptures. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Um, Proverbs 20.11, you probably can't see, but you probably know it. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. Proverbs 21.8, the way of man is froward and strange, but as for the pure, his work is right. In the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And 1 John 3.3, 3, every man that hath this hope, this hope of salvation in himself, purifies himself as God is pure. In common terms, conscience is often described, this is from Wikipedia, as leading to feelings of remorse when a person commits an act that conflicts with their moral values. And if a person continually violates their conscience, how do they feel? They don't feel well, do they? They feel sick inside, and that tends to degrade health. It's not just how you feel right now, but it, it wears away at your health. Um, oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. We shall not want for health if we're fearing the Lord and obeying him. Psalm 37, 3, trust in the Lord and do good, so you will dwell in the land and you will be fed. He doesn't say you'll be fed too much or too rich, but you will receive what you need. Romans 12, 1 and 2, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
and that's where our health comes from. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1031. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And if some of it seems hard, you have the promise in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So we're going to sing our closing hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And I want you to notice stanza two says, There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. He wants to give us that abundant, wonderful life as we submit to him and obey him in all things. Then the last stanza, his word will not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his salvation to tell. Amen.